All right, good morning. I'll start now. It's 9.32, so I'll begin. Um, Mr. Dietzel asked a good question, and some other people have asked the same question, so I just want to, I guess I will address it since it's come up more than once. On uh, paper number one, um, I and I might have I might say this in the syllabus. I, I have to go back. I know I said it previously. I don't know if I continued it into this syllabus, but anyways, um, as long as you give me the identifying information, your name, um, the class, the page number, or the paper number, um, then whatever you want to do for the formatting of the paper is up to you. If you want to use the American Psychological Association or the Modern Language Association, APA or MLA, that's fine, as long as you're consistent throughout the paper, because that's how I'll judge you. I mean, if, if you're going to use MLA standards, then I expect you to use the MLA standards. So if you're inconsistent with those, then that will certainly affect the grade on your paper. Um, hello, sir. Uh, but just be consistent on whatever you do choose. I don't have any particular standard that I expect you to use. Uh, that's your choice. Uh, but um, remember that if you are going to use citations in the paper, I don't require citations. I'm mainly looking for thought, that you've you understood the questions, and that you've addressed the questions, you've thought about the questions, but I understand that some people might want to throw in quotations and, and citations and stuff like that. That's fine. Uh, obviously, if you do use a citation, you're going to need a, a work cited page, so you're going to have to tell me where you got the citation from. So please remember that, because if I'm reading your paper and I see, like, Smith, page 100, and okay, fine, and then I, there's no work cited page, and I'm wondering where did this citation come from? That's, so that's going to be a knock on your paper, or a ding against your paper, uh, a negative. Uh, so that's what I would just like to say about that. Okay, continuing Hispanic Heritage Month. I have a picture here of Venerable Alphonse Gallegos. Alphonse Gallegos. He's dressed up as a bishop as a Catholic bishop, so you can assume that he was a Catholic bishop. And he is an American. Remember, Junipero Serra was born in Spain, although he's considered an American saint. And um, Carlos, uh, what was his last name? Carlos uh, Rodriguez Santiago was from Puerto Rico, and he was techni technically an American citizen, but um, Bishop Alphonse Gallegos was actually an American citizen born in the United States of America. He was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he is on his way to sainthood. He is considered venerable, which means that he can be honored in the Catholic Church. When did he live? He was born in 1931, and he died in 1991. So not that long ago, not within your lifetime, within my lifetime, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but not that long ago. And he was an auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Sacramento, California. An auxiliary bishop is like a helper bishop. You have the main bishop of the diocese, and then sometimes they'll have a bunch of helper bishops who help out. So auxiliary bishop, um, Sacramento, California. Uh, he was made that in 1981, and he served that uh, in that position until his death in 1991. Bishop Gallegos was nicknamed the Bishop of the Barrios. Why? Because he would go out at night and minister to gang members, um, low riders, I guess that's the term for those who have those cars and they have them really low to the ground and they bounce up, they have hydraulics so that they bounce up and down and stuff like that. Um, and other at-risk youth in the impoverished areas of Los Angeles and Sacramento um, where he was bishop. So that was his ministry to them. And so he was known amongst the gang members for that. In 1991, he didn't die. Uh, he died kind of a tragic death. Apparently, um, he was in a, the car he was in. They pulled over on the side of the road, either to help somebody who had stalled, or just they pulled over to the, on the side of the road, and another car came and smashed into them, and in the process, hit the bishop and 
um, killed him so he was, when he was struck by a driver. Nevertheless, he is on his way to sainthood, mainly, I would assume, for his ministry to gang members and whatnot, and he was known as a good and holy man. And so I ask Venerable Alphonse Gallegos for your prayers for us and your blessing on the Hispanic community in the United States. Amen. Look, sir. Okay, let me see here before I forget or miss anybody. Mr. Kazen is here. Ms. Pullman. Let's see Ms. Pullman. Ms. Reeser. Reeser, no. Saravo. Okay, Mr. Thatch. Mr. Thomas is here. Okay, good. Okay, continuing our discussion of Jesus Christ as the standard for Catholic bioethics, we ended with this PowerPoint, just some basic details and uh, backstory and history of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, just to refresh your memory, you, he was a Jew, remember that, he was a Jewish man. And you can see when he or he lived from 6 BC to 33 AD. He was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth in the north of Palestine. This region at the time was generally called Palestine. These are the various areas of Palestine, Judea, the province of Judea, Samaria, Galilee, the Decapolis, other areas. But this whole region could be called Palestine or Israel, if you want, but it wasn't really called Israel at that time, at least not by the Romans. Remember, he was known as G he's known as Jesus of Nazareth in religious studies, because that's the town where he grew up and where he was from. But he had no name, last name to speak of. Most people didn't in the ancient world. So when you hear him call Jesus Christ, that's really uh, a shortened version of Jesus the Christ or Jesus the Messiah, which is a title. And his early on, his trade was as a craftsman, as a tectone. This was the last point I made in the last class. The Greek word here on the PowerPoint, a tectone, is it can be. A, it's usually interpreted as a carpenter, but uh, you know it can be a more generalized term of just someone who's a tradesman or a craftsman, a person who works with his hands, um, kind of like a uh, what you might call it. Um, um, a construction worker, if you might, someone who make builds houses and stuff like that. But uh, carpenter will do for our purposes. And later in his life, he uh, changed that and became a religious figure and a teacher. And hence, we get to Jesus of Jesus the Christ. Let me see if I uh, do that. Yes. Okay. At some point in time, Jesus associated himself with, or was a follower of, it's not clear which, um, a prophetic figure, a Jewish prophetic figure, an, a religious figure uh, in contemporary Judaism of the time, and a preacher known as John the Baptist, Okay, who also had a title. He's known as the Baptist. Why? We'll find out in a moment. Um, here's just a picture I drew of this event. Jesus apparently, um, of Jesus becoming his follower or, or being part of his community. Here's a picture of John the Baptist, he was dressed up, you know, apparently in the garb of a prophet. He wore camel's hair and a leather belt, and these are kind of stereotypical dress for people who were considered prophets in Judaism or holy men. And he baptized Jesus. He's called the Baptist because he would dunk people down into water. Um, as a sign of conversion or repentance, a change of life, that they would renew their, li their lives as Jews and start, I guess, living the, the religion more faithfully or be more committed. And this was unusual. I mean, this is, this is how you get a title, you know, as John the Baptist, because people didn't usually do that to themselves. I mean, Jews had ritual washings and water, 
um, which they did do quite frequently, but you did it yourself. You didn't have someone do it for you. So to have someone else dunk you down in water was a rather unusual activity. Hence, John the Baptist. This uh, action of baptism, what is it? Just very simply, so I'll give you a definition. This dunking in water is, uh, is called baptism. And it's simply, that's exactly what the Greek word means, baptizo. I mean, there's no big mystery about the word. It means to dunk or to immerse in water. Anything. It could be a person, could be a thing, doesn't matter. But it takes on a, a religious context, a more technical context, um, in, in the person of John the Baptist, this religious figure within Judaism at the time. So Jesus apparently starts to follow this man, John, who may have been related to Jesus. We don't know. If you read the Gospel of Luke, one of the four Gospels that I put up on the other PowerPoint slide, according to this man, Luke, John was a cousin of Jesus. But, you know, that Luke is our only source for that information. So take it for what it's worth. We don't know. Um, but apparently di Jesus did know John the Baptist. Nevertheless, even though he was a follower, apparently, of John, or at least uh, knew John, around 30 years of age, Jesus decides to go out on his own, on his own religious mission. And I say around 30 years of age. Again, we get this information from the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is the more historical of the Gospels. Luke was kind of a historian at heart, and so when he writes his, uh, his book, he is consciously trying to um, integrate historical details into the story of Jesus. So, so he's the one who tells us that around the age of 30, so around 30, could have been 28, he could have been 32. You know, it's, it's a ballpark figure. He doesn't say he was actually 30 years old, but around the age of 30, Jesus starts his own religious career. He goes on in his own itinerant ministry, walking around, teaching people, uh, and he does this throughout Galilee, in his home place of Galilee, but he also goes to the south to the province of Judea. How long did he do this for? Again, this is something that's not completely clear. If you read, for example, the Gospel of John, it seems that he did it for about three years, and that seems to be the traditional number that historians accept, that it was around a three-year ministry or three-year period of time. But if you read Matthew Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it seems to be compressed within a year. But then again, you have to remember these books were written with a certain point of view, and they weren't always trying to give actual historical accounts you know they weren't trying to they weren't history books so they weren't writing histories although as i said luke is the most historical of three of the four um they were telling stories about jesus and the impression is given that it could be a year but traditionally it's it's a three-year ministry and what was he known as he was known as a teacher he's called a teacher so he, he's a, he gives, a, he, he's a purveyor of religious knowledge. He was known as a miracle worker, a person who could work wonders, do things that were apparently physically not possible. He was an exorcist. People forget about this one when they talk about Jesus, but actually exorcisms were a big, big part of his ministry. And an exorcism is simply casting out evil spirits driving them out. I see they have a new Exorcist movie coming out in the movie theaters. Exorcist Believers. <laughs> I still haven't decided whether I'm going to go watch it yet. It's rated R. Uh, it might be too violent for me. I'm getting too old. But uh, nevertheless, it looks like it could be interesting. But an exorcist, uh, the, the, the Greek word exorcizo, or uh, the Latin word exorcizo just simply means to cast out. That's literally what it means, to, to cast something out, to throw it out. And finally, he's known as a healer. A healer. 
And that applies to us in bioethics because that's what we're talking about. Bioethics is dealing with healthcare, which deals with healing, bringing wholeness to a person to take away illness. So it was no, this is a major, obviously this is a major human concern. You know, people, and, and Jesus was not the only one known as a healer. He is known as a healer. That's part of his pedigree. But in the ancient world, it was, uh, you have other um, religious, not religious figures, but you have other people like Apollonius of Tyana, who was a fan. Apollonius. Tyana. Um, who was before Jesus. I believe he was before Jesus, was another well-known ancient figure. Because why? Why did he become famous? Because he could affect cures on people. Why was Hippocrates known? I mean, Hippocrates was not a god or he was not a religious figure, but he was known and respected because he could cure people of their illnesses and diseases. So this is um, this is uh, seems to be a trait that people are looking for, especially when you didn't know where diseases came from and you didn't really know what to do about them. You just had to kind of ride them out and hope that the disease didn't kill you along the way. So he was known as a healer. And I put on some on the PowerPoint just some pictures to illustrate this Jesus teaching the crowds, Jesus casting out a demon. Jesus working a miracle. They're on the in a boat during a stormy during a storm on the sea, and he calms the storm down so they don't all drown. And then finally, Jesus lifting up probably a leper. Um, it's probably the cure of a leper. Um, so healing people of that leprosy, skin diseases were a big deal, and they're still a big deal. I, you see these commercials for Sky Rizzy all over the place, you know little pill that will take away you know the 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 what is it called the um uh what's what's the word for it um it's not a skin disease but you know how it is uh, echinacea not echinacea no not echinacea um but you know i'm talking about the you know you get the the skin uh rashes and people have those skin rashes and whatnot and now they have a pill it's all over the television um with these commercials so these are still issues even today people are looking for cures for skin ailments not leprosy per se um but certainly skin ailments da -da 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 -da. oh wrong muscle memory wrong computer but jesus runs into into opposition there is controversy over jesus jesus is not um necessarily an acceptable figure to everybody within judaism he, he starts to butt heads with the jewish religious leadership and other political groups why well for the religious leaders, they think that his um, his behavior is sometimes scandalous, that he does things that break their religious laws. For example, in regards to healings, um, still thinking of that word for the skin disease. Nah, maybe it'll come to me. Anyways, um, breaking the religious laws. For example, Jesus performs healings on Saturdays, which is the Sabbath which is a day when you're not supposed to work, and they consider healings performing work. So according to the, the letter of the law, at least according to their reading of it, Jesus is breaking that law, and as a Jew, he should not do that. So his, his, uh, his, his uh, behavior is considered scandalous. They think that he uh, also he eats and drinks too much, especially with the wrong people. Uh, I don't know if Jesus ate and drank too much, but that's that was one of the knocks on him, that he was a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners, that he hung out, he, he would hang out with the wrong types of people. He wouldn't, he would hang out with people who were maybe not living good or righteous lives. So he hung out with prostitutes, he hung, people who were considered sinners or the unclean, like lepers. I showed you the picture of him of clean, curing a leper. 
Um, you weren't supposed to hang out with lepers, mainly because leprosy was so contagious. It was dangerous. You wanted to stay away from a leper, and lepers were supposed to stay outside of the town. So they were kind of pariahs or outcasts in that sense. But Jesus would hang out with them. Of course, he'd cure them as well. Uh, he didn't leave them lepers, but nevertheless, he didn't avoid them. And he also would hang out with people who were considered traitors or sellouts, like the tax collectors. The, these were Jews who would collect taxes for the Roman occupiers, and so they were considered unfaithful or untrustworthy to their own people. Jesus also claims to forgive people's sins. And here we, we get into... Um, rather theological issues, issues of Jewish belief. Only you, you sin against God from the perspective of the Jews. So only God is, is worthy of forgiving sins. No human being is, is able to do that. But Jesus claims to forgive sins, which is considered blasphemous. It's considered um, an offense against God. I don't know if I put blasphemy on. No, I did not. Um, but the word blasphemy is to be speak dishonorably or irreverently towards something that is sacred, okay, something that is holy. So Jesus, a man claiming to forgive people's sins, is considered an offense. And Jesus even does this in the process of healing. He, he combines it with his healing activity. Um, before There's a man who's brought to him who's paralyzed, uh, brought to him, obviously, because he couldn't bring himself, and in the, before Jesus even heals the man of his paralysis, he says, child, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know what sins the guy committed, if it's some sin that caused the paralysis or whatever, but Jesus sees a spiritual element to, to the illness, and he cures that first by forgiving the man's sins. Well, this, the, the, the religious people who are there hear this, and they kind of go mad, go go ballistic they kind of lose their minds they're like you know they start whispering to themselves and like, only god can forgive sins jesus is just a man so this brings him into conflict with the religious authorities he also says and talks about god as if god is his father and he calls himself god's son and this this is this is dangerous because Jews are monotheists. They believe in one God, and they believe that God is separate from from the created world. He is not part of the created world, and he, so he doesn't have children. You know, he's not a father with a wife. You know, he's not a, a, a male with a female and producing children. And so he has a son. So for Jesus to say he's God's son was also something that was kind of shocking to people. Um, and Jesus didn't seem to mean it in a metaphorical way. I mean, like we can say, oh, we're all God's sons and daughters, meaning that like God takes care of us and he cares about all of us and loves all of us. All right, Even though literally we might not think that we're God's sons and daughters, um, like he gave, you know, he was our father and we there's some sort of mother God who gave birth to us. So we, we don't mean that. We mean that we have a a kind of a, an affinity for God, a, a union with God, and he cares for us. Jesus didn't seem to mean that, which was very odd for a Jew to talk like that. Jesus seemed to talk about God was his father in a way that, um, in a more literal way. In fact, Jesus never talks about his, if you read the writings about Jesus, Jesus never talks about his human father. He, he, in fact, he acts like he doesn't have a human father, even though he supposedly does. So he, this leads to, now it doesn't mean that Jesus is somehow God or divine, but it seems as Jesus keeps talking this way, and the way he keeps acting, he keeps acting like he's a God, or he's somehow in place of God for his followers, forgives, forgive their sins. Um, also, he has a special attachment to God. God is his father, his parent. Um, in a way that God is not related to anybody else, it seems that he is making himself equal to God, if not God himself. And some Jews kind of call Jesus out on this. In fact, they want to kill him over it because the, that was a capital offense in, Jew, in Jewish religion. Um, th there was, that was the ultimate blasphemy to claim that you were somehow God. 
What gets him in trouble, so this is getting him in trouble with the religious authorities. What gets him in trouble with the political authorities, namely the Romans who are in control at the time because Palestine was part of their empire, is that he makes a claim or a statement about destroying the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was the place of worship, the one place of worship where uh, for Jews, um, they would all go there for their sacrifices when they could. And it was a, not just a religious institution, but it was like a political institution as well. But so Jesus seems to make an attack on the temple. He talks about, you know, there is a time when the temple will be destroyed. And also that, and that Jesus will be able to rebuild the temple. And it's not exactly clear what Jesus meant by that. But it doesn't sound good. <laughs> it doesn't, at least to the people who are in power. What's more troubling, though, uh, than destroying the temple, because, the, you know, what Jesus said about the temple could be open to interpretation, and he's predicting it in the future and whatever, um, but he also seems to be talking about himself as this figure called a Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. And a Christ, the Christ is this Jewish belief of a political figure um, a king figure, a king savior who will come in the future to liberate the Jews from all of their enemies and establish peace on the earth. Peace on the earth might not have been a problem for the Romans, but certainly a king savior who is going to destroy the Romans, who were the enemies of the Jews at the time, that was something not that was not good and you know was would have gotten the um, antennae up of the Roman leaders, the Roman leadership, the political leaders, um, if Jesus was claiming to be this figure who is going to do these things, apparently, or at least people thought he was going to do them. So Jesus seems to claim to be the Messiah, the Christ. Oh, I do put blasphemy there. Okay, that's after the incarnation. All right, well, let's give me a hold on one second while I'm thinking of it. Mr. Thatch. The, just so you understand the terminology, because I'm going to use some words and I want you to know what I mean when I'm using them, um, this idea of Jesus being God in the flesh is called the incarnation, which simply means to be, be enfleshed. In carne, carnis means flesh or meat in Latin. So it's the Christian belief that God became human flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. And this is a word that's used to explain um, how Jesus could talk about himself sometimes as if he were God, because he seemed to be a man. He seemed to be a fully human man, but he was doing things and claiming things about himself that seemed to be divine. And see there at the bottom, I do give the definition of blasphemy. I thought I did. Blasphemeo in Greek, to speak evil or profane words, especially about God, or to take sacred things lightly, like not seriously. And this was a major offense in, in any religion, not just Jewish religion, even you know the, the, the pagan religions, the non-Jewish religions of Greece and Rome and other religions of the ancient world, Hinduism. And so, blasphemy is, is usually a major sin or a breach because if you offend the gods, the gods can then come and hurt you or hurt the community. So you don't want to offend the gods. You don't want to take them lightly because of the gods. And this can also apply to bad gods like demons, because in some religions there are bad gods. Like um, if, if the gods think you're not taking them seriously, then they can harm you. They can send a plague and cause illness amongst amongst your animals and kill off your cattle. They can send, you know, make your women barren so that they don't have children. Um, they can do all sorts of things, give you cancer. So blasphemy is not just it was not just a Jewish thing, which is just like a theological thing. Like, oh, he's clean. He's doing something that's God. You know, God should only do when it. You know, but it really doesn't matter. No, there was a serious offense. You don't want to make the gods angry. Here's a definition of the Messiah, which I already gave to you, but I'll give you a more um, a fleshed out definition. 
the Messiah, because you have to understand what the Messiah is, understand who Jesus is. So you have to delve in a little bit into Jewish history. Um, but a descendant of a king, this man David, a famous king of the Jews, who would come to restore the kingdom of Israel, defeat her enemies, and establish a reign of peace based on the perfect following of God's law. So the Messiah is a political figure, but also a religious figure. The, the, this Messiah is going to restore the ancient kingdom, the, the political autonomy of the Jews, but the Messiah is also going to establish the perfect following of God's law. Um, and this is not, this is religious law. This is not political law, but this is the religious law that you find in the Bible uh, amongst the Jews. From Jewish belief, there was, there is a belief amongst Jews that God has made a solemn, a, an agreement, a contract with the Jewish people. And the Jewish people, and, and it's a unique contract. It's amongst all the nations of the world, the peoples of the world. The Jews are considered special in the eyes of God because only with them he has made this contract. This is their belief. You don't have to accept it, but to understand the Messiah, you have to understand how the Jews view themselves. The Jews had a kingdom. They had a, a government, a kingdom. They had a king. Um, king David was not the first king they ever had, but he was considered or is considered the greatest of the kings. And there is a belief that God loved David so much that he made even a special agreement with David that his throne, his kingdom, would last forever, that there would always be descendants on his throne. Democracy, crucifixion, okay, stay on the side of that. Well, that didn't happen. The kingdom um, of Israel, as it's called, um, under David, did not survive. It was eventually conquered by other kingdoms, surrounding kingdoms. Um, this happened for, um, for Israel. Or, well, I didn't give the map for that. I thought I could put the map on there, but I guess not. Let me see if I did. Maybe I just put it out of order. Nope. Didn't do it. Okay, that's fine. I thought I put a map of the kingdom on here. Anyways, um, the kingdom did not survive. It was eventually conquered in the five, in the 6th century BC. Um, you want the exact date, it's 587 BC, if you're curious. The kingdom of Judea, it was called. And this is where we get our word Jew from. Judea. So David's kingdom and the kingdom of his successors did not survive. So how do you explain that? The Jews hypothesized that God would send a descendant of David who would reestablish that kingdom forever. And this descendant is called technically the Messiah, the anointed one, Mashiach in Hebrew. Um, oh, that there. Okay, that's fine to pour oil on. Why? Because they would pour oil all over the head of the king to make him the king. So an anointed one. Jesus, this is what Jesus seems to be claiming to be. He seems to be claiming to be this anointed one. And his followers believe that eventually. Hence, he's called Jesus the Christ. Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. And they mean, mean the same thing, anointed one. So Jesus, literally Jesus the anointed one, is his name, or his, his title, his name and his title. Okay, so Jesus runs into controversy with the religious leaders. There seems to be some problems that could arise with the political leaders um, that are going to have um, issues for him. Jesus, one of Jesus's main issues that he fights against or that he, he teaches against and has problems with is the issue of hypocrisy. What he sees wrong in Judaism is that people are not doing what they say they believe. <laughs> No. 
he accuses the religious, his religious opponents and the religious leaders, and this further gets him in trouble with them, of being hypocrites in their religious observance. They, they teach with authority. He accepts that they have authority, the religious leaders have authority, but they don't practice what they preach. They don't adhere to the values that they say they adhere to. Generally, they did not care about the spiritual needs or the suffering of the people. They would observe the religious laws diligently, like don't do any work on the Sabbath, even healings, but they lacked judgment, mercy, faith. They were hypocrites. And the word hypocrisy means literally to play a part. You're pretending, hypocrino, you're a pretender. You're a poser, as they used to say in the 90s, but I don't know if they say that anymore. And Jesus kind of arrogates to himself. I mean, Jesus had no self-esteem issues. <laughs> if, you read, if you read the stories of, with Jesus in them, Jesus had no doubts about himself. He was fully self-confident. He had full self-esteem. And he can't understand and he faults the religious authorities for not recognizing his superior authority. So all of this eventually comes to a head around the belief is 33 AD, that's the traditional date. Jesus of Nazareth is arrested by the Jewish leadership. And he's handed over to the Romans, who are the political leaders, and, and really were the only ones who could execute someone. The, the Jews didn't have the power to do that under the Romans. The Romans kept that power apparently for themselves. Jesus of Nazareth is judged guilty of crime, and he's sentenced to death by crucifixion, which is basically, you know, you hang two, you have a, a post in the in the ground. It's an ancient form. It didn't. The Romans didn't come up with it. It came comes from Persia, ancient Persia. Um, but you have a post in the ground, and then you nail someone to a piece of wood. You hoist them up onto the post, and you hang them. You suspend them from that post, and you form a cross. Hence, it's a crux, a, cr a cross, and you're making a cross. Crux facio, facio means to make. So it's crucifixion. And it was a form of capital punishment. There was nothing unique about Jesus of Nazareth. It, uh, it was a common form of capital punishment uh, in, in other cultures and for the Romans especially. Why was Jesus of Nazareth executed? Well, we don't know. That's one of the mysteries of history, as they say. Oh, and while I'm at it, I just want to, this picture here is this fascinating picture. It's called the Alexomenos Graffito. If you have a graffiti, a graffito is something like that's painted on a wall or etched on a wall in this case. And uh, if you have more than one, it's called graffiti. So we have it in the English language of if someone spray paints a whole bunch of stuff on a, on a building or on the side of a building on a wall, it's called graffiti. But if you have one, it's called graffito, singular. And uh, this one is called Alexomenos because Alexomenos is a man's name, and he's named in this graffito. In this graffito, you can see maybe see some of the words that are etched into this wall that they found. And it dates from around 200 AD. Now, if you can see this, it's a man, or it looks like a person crucified, certainly crucified, they're on a cross, they're suspended on a cross, um, but with, a, appears like a, a horse's head or a donkey's head has been placed on the person, and over here is a, a figure of a, a person, a man, assuming a man, with his arm raised, probably in salutation, because that's how the Romans did things, you know. I mean, the, the Nazis did not come up with this. This is from the Romans did this. So with the form of hail, like hi, okay? Um, hello. So, you know, hailing this figure on what seems to be this cross. And then we have the words in Greek, Alexomenos, the man's name, Sabete Theon. Alexomenos worships God. Whoops. Go back. Alexamenos worships God. 
as far as we can tell, there's only one group that worships a crucified man, only one religion that worships a crucified man, Christianity. So scholars are generally agreed that this is a representation of the crucifixion of Jesus, and it's probably making fun of it, because Jesus' head has been replaced with a horse's head. And it's probably making fun of Alex, this Christian, Alexamenos, who foolishly worships this crucified man. What's interesting is not only is this not probably not by a Christian, it's probably by a non-Christian hand, but it's our earliest representation that we have actually of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, sir. Why would they? Couldn't it be the crucifixion was a capital one? Couldn't it be anyone? Well, as I said, who else could it be? Do you, who who is considered a god who is nailed to a cross? What other candidate do you got? Historically. Mm -hmm. What other religion? Probably Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, is it 100%? No. I mean, could it just be representing another crucified person? And they're, But, but they're, they seem to be making fun of it. They're calling it, calling whatever this is a god, and he is worshiping it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so... Yeah. It's, it seems to fit Jesus of Nazareth, because as far as I know, he's the only one who is, fits both the bill of being a god, or considered a god by his followers, and was crucified. So, but again, nothing is 100%. Could be wrong. Not gonna <laughs> Nevertheless... Why was he executed? As I said, we don't know. The, for the Jewish leaders, it may have been his claim that the temple would be destroyed. It could have been his claim to be the Messiah, which they didn't believe. Um, but the charge on the cross that the Romans put on there, and, and this was, again, not something unique to Jesus, that um, when uh, a person was crucified, you put their charge over their head so people would know what crime they were being killed for. It was a legal requirement. Uh, presumably a legal requirement. I'm presuming they required it. They certainly did it. Um, and the charge that's recorded for Jesus is, this is the king of the Jews. So that would have been enough to execute him for the Romans. I mean, you, the, the Romans didn't put up with any kind of um, political competition. Um, the Roman emperor was was the, the leader of the empire, and, you, and anyone who would challenge that would certainly, or would almost certainly, end up being killed or executed for that. It would be considered treasonous. So if Jesus was going around kind of, you know, hint, hint, wink, wink, I'm this Messiah, I'm this descendant of King David, and I'm going to overthrow our enemies, uh, that was dangerous, certainly with the Romans. And they seem to have taken him seriously because they killed him because he was claiming to be king of the Jews. Due to his shameful, humiliating death, um, from what we can tell, at least from the Christian writings, the Christian writings admit this, so at least they're honest, um, many of the followers lost faith in Jesus. Um, those are some of them who were his closest followers, the apostles. We'll talk about the apostles later, because um, you have to, if you're going to talk about the church. Um, you know, they went back to their, their jobs. They just went back to their normal life. They, they, they didn't continue on them. They didn't say, hey, let's continue on the mission. Let's keep it going. They're just like, you know, Jesus got humiliated. We lost. <laughs> we lost the election. Uh, so instead of rioting, they went back to work as fishermen. Well, they weren't all fishermen, I'm sure, but some of them were. And, you know, a lot of them didn't even show up at the cross. They didn't even show up at the crucifixion to see Jesus die. Um, and they would hide their following of Jesus. Nevertheless, if, the, if that was just the story, if it was just, you know, the tragic ending of a possibly a good man or a religious figure who, you know, got, you know, uh, got killed, then whatever. Those things happen. Bad things happen to good people sometimes. Historical circumstances come into play. But it doesn't end there. And hence, this is how we get to the world religion that we come to know as Christianity. The resurrection. 
A few days after Jesus' death, some of his followers claimed that they had actually seen him. Now, I have to say actually, not mystically, because, you know, they could have claimed that they had like a mystical vision of Jesus, you know, that Jesus was with God now, or Jesus was glorified in heaven, and all those things, I guess, could be true, um, if you want to believe them, but that's not what they were claiming in the resurrection. His fo some of his followers started claiming that we had seen him bodily alive, that he died, he did die on the cross, no one denied that. And I know some people might think, well, maybe Jesus just fainted on the cross. or Probably not. Historically, with crucifixion, suffocation was the way you died. It wasn't blood loss. It was suffocation. Your, uh, your, um, your, respiratory, your, your body wouldn't be able to hold the weight anymore, and the person would asphyxiate. So if Jesus fainted on the cross, he was a goner. <laughs> he was definitely a goner um, because he wouldn't be able to, he wouldn't be conscious and wouldn't be able to lift himself, have been able to lift himself up. And as any of those of you who are taking the medical sciences know, lack of brain, lack of oxygen to the brain for a very short, even for a very short period of time leads to brain damage. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious it's it's a it's a entertaining theory that no oh, maybe Jesus just fainted on the cross and then he he you know kind of revived himself in the tomb or something after he was buried, but probably not physiologically it's probably not possible. Nevertheless, whatever you believe about it, the, his followers were claiming that Jesus had risen again. Resurgo just simply means to rise up, to lift up. That changed everything. That now we have that what brings Christianity to this little Jewish movement, this little Jewish reform movement, and here we're starting to approach some completely new religion developing. This this belief in the resurrection, along with other unique beliefs about Jesus being God and stuff like that. But the resurrection changed everything for his followers by by raising Jesus bodily from the dead. The belief was that God had not only glorified him, but confirmed his claims to be the Messiah, because his claims seemed to be destroyed on the cross. In fact, for his opponents, his Jewish opponents, the fact that Jesus died a shameful death seemed to be proof positive of God punishing him, that he was not the Messiah. But the fact that he was raised from the dead for his followers showed to them that, oh yeah, he was what we believed that he was. He wasn't a failure. So whatever Christ's followers thought he was before, whether Jesus was just a prophet, or the Messiah, or a rabbi, some religious teacher, or even a miracle worker, or even a failure, whatever they thought he was before, they could no longer understand him in the same way after there was, they came to believe that, yes, Jesus had, his dead body had come back to life and he had been raised. All that Jesus said and did, especially his, his messianic acts, quote-unquote messianic acts, if you wanted to believe he was the Messiah, um, as well as his statements, even his claims to divinity, seemed to then make sense, or at least become understandable in the light of the resurrection. And so I have this quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 638. I think it's part of the readings um, that are coming up. Um, I, I give you some, just some summary readings from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, just so I don't have to go over everything, but it gives you an idea of what the, the Catholic Church believes about Jesus and why he's important for the Catholic Church, and, of course, for how the Catholic Church views bioethics. The resurrection of Jesus is the crowning truth of our faith in Christ. Notice, not the crucifixion, even though you will see crosses, you know, a lot of crosses. There really isn't any, I don't know if there's any real good way to represent the resurrection. Um, the, the crucifixion kind of comes ready-made as a religious symbol. Um, it's almost perfect for any religion that wants to promote itself. Um, I don't know what you would do. I guess you could show an empty tomb, the door to an empty tomb or something. It doesn't have that same resonance, I guess, that you know a guy hanging on a cross does. So you see more of the crucifixion than the resurrection, but that's not the crowning truth. The fact that Jesus died is a fact, that Jesus died bodily, 
entered into death. He suffered death. But it's the resurrection, his rising to life, that is the crowning truth. A faith believed and lived as the central truth by the first Christian community and handed on as fundamental by tradition, sacred tradition. We'll talk about sacred tradition later when we talk about sources of authority for how the church makes decisions in bioethics. Tradition is part of that process. Um, but handed on by the lived experience of the church, established by the documents of the New Testament, and preached as an essential part of the Paschal mystery along with the cross. What is the Paschal mystery? The Paschal mystery is, is just a technical religious terminology for the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, it's, it's a mystery because it belongs in the realm of God. Um, it's, it's not something that's logically provable or necessarily logically understandable. It has to be experienced as a supernatural reality um, because it involves a the belief is it involves a supernatural person, i.e. Jesus, the Son of God. So the resurrection is the point of departure. What did Jesus talk about? What did Jesus teach? Now, we had an overview of Jesus' life, what we know about Jesus' life, what we know about what Christians believed about him and said about him and what made him important for them. But what did Jesus teach? What did he talk about? Well, the main thing Jesus talked about was this reality called the kingdom or the rule of God. It's a metaphor. It's an image which Jesus used to describe how God has control over all of creation and all and over humanity. And although we use the word kingdom, and, and there still are kingdoms today, you know, you have the United Kingdom, England, or we say England, but England is only part of the United Kingdom, actually. But you have the United Kingdom of, of Great Britain, and uh, you have other kingdoms. The Netherlands is a kingdom. Sweden is a kingdom. Um, Canada is a kingdom. Now it's a kingdom. It used to be a queendom. You had uh, Queen Elizabeth II, but now you have Charles III. Um, yeah, the, the head of state of Canada is King Charles III. So it's a constitutional monarchy. It's essentially um, it's, it's, it's a kingdom in a sense, we could say. Um, so there are still kingdoms, but maybe kingdom doesn't resonate as much because we don't come from a kingdom, we come from a republic, and uh, we don't have kings and queens and aristocracy. Uh, so the word, but the word that is translated kingdom has the generalized sense of reigning or ruling something, governing something. So you could say the government of God or the rule of God is probably a better translation, but the traditional one is kingdom, so stick with that. This is the central theme or metaphor of Jesus' preaching. The first, the first words of Jesus in the first gospel, uh, maybe I didn't tell you this, but I'll tell you this now, out of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though Mark comes second, Scholars are generally agreed that Mark was probably the first of these, these, uh, this genre to be written, to have been written, the Gospel of Mark. Um, so you look there for the early stuff about Jesus, or at least the early point of view about Jesus. That doesn't mean that there isn't early stuff in the other Gospels written later. But after John, John who? John the Baptist. John was also arrested because he was becoming a political liability, and he was also executed. But a religion didn't erupt around him for some reason, interestingly enough. But it does around Jesus, who had the same, similar things happen to him. So after John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news, the gospel of God. And here's a definition of what it is. This is the time of fulfillment. So something's happening here. Something is different. Something has changed. Something's being fulfilled. The, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel or the good news. Okay, so Jesus comes to announce this thing called a kingdom of God. 
what does the kingdom of God mean? And, and again, with Jesus, if we have his teachings. We have a, a bunch of his teachings, not all of his teachings. We have a bunch of his teachings. And it's not always clear what he means by it because he, he prefers to tell stories about the kingdom of God and what it looks like rather than giving definitions. Um, but we seem to understand that this this metaphor was designed to emphasize God's loving and faithful rule and control over his people. God is a king, but he's not a king to be feared, or he's not a king who rules from far away. Rather, he, God is a loving father who rejoices in bringing back his lost children. So there are a couple of um, God as a father is, is used as a metaphor by Jesus to describe this relationship, and the Jews are God's children, and they're lost in the view of Jesus. They have to agree with that. I mean, there might have been Jews who said, oh, we're not lost, we know what we're doing, um, we're perfectly fine. But you have to go with what Jesus thought, what was going on in his mind. And in his mind, the Jews were lost. They, needed to, they had lost their way and needed to find their way back. How does God bring them back? Well, he sends his beloved son, i.e. me. G well, not me, but Jesus, J.C. What does life in the kingdom of God entail? Well, much like John the Baptist, John, as I told you, John the Baptist, he was dunking people in water for what? For conversion, for repentance, for a change of life. People were not living the Jewish law um, as John thought they were, and Jesus has this, this similar message. People are, not li people are lost, and they're away from God, and they need conversion or repentance, so they need a change of mind or heart, which is conversion. It turn, turning towards something, converso, to turn around. They need to turn around. Literally in Greek, it comes from the word for nous, for mind. It means basically to change your mind. People need to change, we would say change their hearts toward, back towards God and, and change those things in their lives that maybe are not what God wants. So it's not a conversion to what? What, are, what is Jesus asking? Was Jesus asking people to be converted to? It was more a conversion to whom? Meaning Jesus himself. Okay, so again, Jesus had no self esteem issues. He wasn't, he was a, he could see, be seen as a Jewish reform leader of a Jewish reform movement in a way, but it was more than that because he was really drawing people not to go back to Judaism itself, but Judaism as he understood it and the way he was living it. So it was more a conversion to whom? To his teachings. He's not just an agent of the kingdom, bringing the kingdom about by what he's doing, the healings, curing sick people, um, casting out demons, working miracles. He's not just bringing it about. He is the king himself. Yes, Jesus told stories, and yes, Jesus was a teacher and he taught people, but mostly, and not to be forgotten or diminished, Jesus was acting, Jesus saw himself as acting out this metaphor of the kingdom of God in his, in his life, in his ministry. He brings the kingdom of God. It's not just some story or concept to him. Hence, when he says, this is the time of fulfillment, this is what's being fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near you, at hand. It's right by your hand. It's right nearby. With me, with the coming of me, right? Jesus, it's here. It's not something that would have come without him. So you don't need to wait for somebody else. It didn't come with John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't preach the kingdom of God. Even though John the Baptist was a contemporary religious figure, religious leader, John the Baptist didn't bring about the kingdom of God like Jesus was. It, was, it wasn't on his radar screen. But with Jesus it is. Without Now with me it comes. Without me it wouldn't, wouldn't have come. You had John the Baptist, but it didn't come. With me it comes. 
So in Jesus, God effects his triumph over, his conquering of the forces of evil, anything that's not according to his will. So we have the article by Bishop John Neenstead, um, Christ the Divine Physician and Healer, in the Lenaker Quarterly. It's one of our readings. It's coming up, or it's something that maybe you've read already. Just a short article, a little talk that the bishop gave to a group, um, I think a Filipino, a group of association of Filipino physicians or something, um, when he talks about you know how Jesus is like a healer and wh what his connection is to the healing profession. And he says, as Jesus goes about announcing his king, that his kingdom has come, the manifestation of that joyful good news is the restoration of the sick, the diseased, and even the dead to a state of wholeness, health, how, in Old English, to be whole. So there's this bioethical component to it. Jesus works out an ethic of healing. And it's, it's an essential part of bringing about the kingdom of God. So now you start to see where Catholic bioethics is coming from. The Catholic, why you have a Catholic hospital, and it's not just any kind of hospital. Um, but it has there's certain values at play here, the, the values of this kingdom of God. It's part of asserting God's rule over creation, his control, his loving control. How do you do this? By bringing health and wholeness to people, to comforting those who are suffering, those you can't heal who are dying, to being with those who are dying and assisting them in their last moments. Why? Because Jesus did these things, and Jesus saw them as essential part of the kingdom of God. So when Jesus even worked miracles, and Jesus did not always work miracles, even though he was known as a wonder worker, there were times when Jesus did not work miracles for people. He didn't do it at the drop of a hat, but apparently he could do it. At least that was his reputation. Whether you believe in miracles or not is, is your belief. But the belief, the belief was that Jesus had, a rep, or at least the, there was the reputation that Jesus could work wonders, could work miracles. But they weren't. He didn't do them for show, and they weren't done as kindnesses to help people necessarily. The miracles had meaning. The miracles, um, the the wonder working was a, again a sign of the kingdom of God's presence and power. That these are signs to show you, if you need to know that the kingdom of God has come. There were also acts of liberation, freedom. And again, this ties into a Catholic bioethic or a Catholic healing ethic, that part of the, the purpose is liberation, freedom from illness, from those things that are contrary to the will of God, that are evils like sickness and disease, to try to fight against them. Why fight against them? To bring about freedom to the sick and the suffering. So everything that enslaved or corrupted or destroyed God's creation and creatures, death, sickness, mental illness, these, were, these are things that people should be freed from. This is just another little quote from a book, uh, Gregory Higgins, Christianity 101, textbook of Catholic theology. In the ministry of Jesus, God's kingdom has drawn near that is, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the power and life, death, and resurrection, we could call the Paschal Mystery, the power and promise of the kingdom has been definitively revealed. The ultimate acting out of salvation and of the kingdom of God was Jesus' acceptance of what presumably he thought and his followers thought was an unjust death sentence, the crucifixion that Jesus was not crucified for something that he was necessarily claiming to be, or at least if he was claiming to be the Messiah, he was not claiming to be the Messiah in the same way that the, the Romans understood it. And so the death of Jesus is seen as a ransom. It's something that was given, it was a price paid in order to release someone from captivity. That's what a ransom is. And 
This is the ultimate acting out of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's, it's life-giving service. Again, you start getting an indication of what a Catholic healthcare ethic should be of life-giving service. Even putting yourself in harm's way. Think about COVID-19. Why do people call nurses and doctors heroes? Um, not just because of the long hours they work, but they were making a, making a conscious choice to put themselves in harm's way, even possibly die, because COVID-19 kill you, in order to treat sick and suffering people. They were giving their lives as a ransom, in a way. They were willing to pay a price in order to bring health and wholeness to very, very sick people. And they're st and still doing that because, of course, you still have people who have contagious diseases who are in hospitals. Now, do they try and protect against that? You put on a gown, you put on gloves, you put on a mask. Yes, you do that, but you, you know what can happen sometimes. There can be exposure, but people take make that choice. Jesus made that choice to accept an unjust death, um, to give him kind of see his life as a, a payment for um, the evil of the world. I guess you could say. You see what the word ransom comes from? It comes from Latin redimo, which means to buy something back. Jesus is buying back humanity in a way from from evil, from sin and death. So he is the price of release. He is the exchange. He is, you could say, the bail posted to get you out of prison, to free humanity from its enslavement. But what is it the enslavement to? To sin and death. To the bad things that people do to each other and to themselves. You don't have to go very far in an emergency room to see that sin in action. <laughs> You know, I mean, yes, a lot of people come into emergency rooms through no fault of their own. There's just an accident or something. But you get people who come in because they're enslaved to an addiction, beaten up by a boyfriend, raped. You, know, you don't you don't have to go very far to see sin in action in an emergency room. Jesus's death is supposed to bring healing to that, or at least is to be a remedy for that. And then, of course, death is the last enemy to be conquered. So for the followers, those who follow Jesus and see him as the, the lutron, I should mention the Greek word, um, the word that's what's used when Jesus calls himself a ransom. Jesus calls himself a ransom. That's how he defines himself. And he uses the Greek word lutron, or at least the author of the gospel uses the Greek word lutron. It's probably still Aramaic. Um, use a different word. But it means a price to be paid. So for Jesus' followers, those who follow him, they experience God's merciful forgiveness and unconditional love in Jesus who died for them, who died as a ransom for their sins, the price to be paid for their sins. Who's calling me? And because of that, Christians are called to share in and to act out that experience with others. So it becomes an ethic of gratitude, of thankfulness, thankfulness for what was done for me, and so I share it with others. I bring that to the hospital where I'm taking care of people who have also been, from, my, from a Christian point of view, been saved and ransomed by Christ. Jesus spells out his overall ethic of how his followers should act towards others, how they should act out the kingdom of God. They should live the kingdom of God in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's one of the, it's part of the readings um, uh, for the course. The, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's also a shorter version in the Gospel of Luke. I forget whether I put that down as well. Um, I might have, but the, certainly you want to read the longer one which is not too long, it's just chapters 5 through 7. It's not that long, but it gives you a sense of um, Jesus' views on how his followers should act towards God and other people.
And I put that on the PowerPoint if you want to see Matthew's chap Matthew chapters 5 through 7 and Luke chapter 6 verses verses 20 to 49. So Luke is significantly shorter, but it's the same material. Luke takes, you know, Luke has a lot of the same material that Matthew Matthew crams it into three chapters, 5, 6 and 7, whereas Luke spreads it out throughout his gospel, the same kind of teachings. He doesn't put them all in a sermon. But yeah, it's a preaching. Jesus goes up a mountain, he sits down, and he, he has this episode where he teaches the people and kind of lays out his, his mission plan, his mission statement on how they're supposed to be. What's significant about this sermon, though, is it's in the context of healing. Jesus went around all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues, teaching in the Jews' synagogues. And the synagogue is just a place where Jews meet for prayer and worship. Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God. So re Matthew reiterates for us in his gospel that Jesus is, again, his focus is this kingdom of God. And curing every disease and illness amongst the people. So this is a, a healing is an essential part of what Jesus of Nazareth is about, and of course what a Catholic bioethics is about. His fame spread to all of Syria. Sir, Syria is north of. I should have a map, but um, actually I do have a map. Syria. Okay, so he, he's going around Galilee doing these things. And his, his fame spreads all around this, these areas, okay, both Jewish and non-Jewish. So he starts getting a name for himself. People want to be cured. People, you know, uh, health and wholeness are, are not modern issues. These were issues even in 2,000 years ago in the first century AD. You know, people are scared. They're, they're scared of sickness. They're worried about it. They don't know what to do about it. But here's someone who seems to have a solution and his, his, his healing seemed to work, so people are attracted to him from all over. And so what did they do? They brought to him all who were sick. So they didn't, they didn't hold back, baby. They brought everybody. Everyone who's sick, we're going to see this guy Jesus because he seems to have the goods. You know, he seems to be the stuff. He, know, he can heal you. So they brought him all who were sick with various diseases and racked with pain. Racked with pain or who were possessed by demons, lunatics, those who were mentally ill, paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, and Judea, I showed you the surrounding areas they follow, they follow him. Probably because it doesn't necessarily mean they believed in him, but they wanted healing. And when he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and he sat down and he began to teach. And so it's in this context of healing that he starts teaching them his view about how they should, what the kingdom of God looks like and how they should be living it. And with that, I'll end on that. And I'll see you on Thursday. <coughs> Have a good day. Hello to whoever is watching. Watch. 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 Watch.